Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. And this is Last Week in the Church, our signature video program, also our only video program, in which we take kind of leftover news, in some cases as much as a week old, throw it into the skillet, add some spices, some sauce, and voila, we have a steaming, piping hot, fresh plate for you. Here's what we've got this week. As Putin's war in Ukraine wages on, we have four angles on it. First, the war appears to be fueling a new rift within Russian orthodoxy that could have both unpredictable and possibly dangerous consequences. Second, the Pope's top diplomat wields both a stick and a carrot. Italian Cardinal Pietro Perolin is, is increasingly sharp in his language condemning the war in Russia, but at the same time expresses the Vatican's total willingness to mediate the conflict. Pope Francis himself also steps it up, essentially ordering the war to stop in his Sunday Angelus address. And finally, could Pope Francis lead a soft power push to end the war? Now, other points of interest from the past week. Nicaragua, the government of Daniel Ortega, has kicked out the Vatican's man in Managua. The Vatican is, to say the least, not happy. In Puerto Rico, a bishop becomes a COVID casualty only not of the disease, but the debate over vaccines. And we will end this week in Hungary, where the Vatican Bank has experienced its latest legal embarrassment abroad, which either confirms the urgency of Pope Francis's cleanup operation or shows that that operation is not working, depending on how you want to look at it. We've also got a very special shout out at the end of this program, so do stick around for that. I will be right back. All right, well, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, March 15th, the Ides of March. And as in the era of Shakespeare, the Ides of March this week are marked by war. In this case, of course, it is Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine, which is now in its third week. Russia appears to be intensifying its bombing campaign and its stranglehold on several Ukrainian cities, although the Ukrainians continue to per put up remarkably ferocious and seemingly effective resistance in many places. In terms of the religious angle on all of this, we will begin with what appears to be a growing rift within the Russian Orthodox world abroad. So the Russian Orthodox Church is led by the Patriarch of Moscow, who at the moment is Patriarch Kirill, and it includes not merely all the Russian Orthodox within Russia itself, but millions of Russians, well, of Russian Orthodox living in the diaspora in various parts of the world including, by the way, Ukraine, and it seems to become increasingly clear that that diaspora is unhappy with the leadership on the war being shown by Patriarch Kirill. Kirill began this conflict with trying to make fairly neutral and cautious statements, but more recently he has gotten into a full upright and locked position in favor of Putin's conflict. He has blamed the war on, among other things, moral decadence, such as a gay pride parade. He has argued that the West provoked this conflict through Russophobia, and on and on. Now, none of this is particularly surprising. There has always been a very close relationship between throne and altar in Russia, dating back to the era of the Tsar. However, Russian Orthodox living outside Russia, who are therefore not directly under the thumb of the Putin government, appear to be becoming increasingly unhappy. Our own Elise Ann Allen, our scintillating superstar senior correspondent at Crux, who is also my wife, and by the way, is running the camera right now. 
You, you can't see her, but she's here. She's waving to you. She loves you people. Anyway, Elise reported this week on a Russian Orthodox parish in Amsterdam where first the clergy and now the parish council have decided basically to disaffiliate from the Moscow Patriarchate. They've asked to be received by the Patriarch of Constantinople, led by Bartholomew I. They're going to have a special meeting later this month where all parishioners can vote on this or have their two cents, but that appears to be the way things are going. The New York Times had a great piece over the weekend about a Russian Orthodox parish in New York where the clergy are trying just to stay out of all of this, trying to stay as apolitical as possible, but the people are increasingly restless, and it's possible they may press to go the same direction as their confreres in Amsterdam. And we could see this happening all across the Russian Orthodox diaspora. In generally, the alternative that these dissenters would see is Constantinople. So as this plays out, there are at least two possible consequences. One, it could significantly strengthen Constantinople's hand in global orthodoxy, bringing significant chunks of large and relatively wealthy orthodox local churches into their orbit rather than Moscow's. Clearly would be a boon to Constantinople's claim to leadership and preeminence in the orthodox world. But, you know, the other consequence is that it could leave the actual Russian Orthodox Church far more isolated, far more under the direct control of the Kremlin, and therefore even less likely to put any distance between itself and whatever Putin and the Kremlin are up to, as ever we will see. All right, Italian Cardinal Pietro Padolini who is, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, generally the soul of caution, okay? Like, okay, here's the situation. If he were standing in his house, which had just been leveled to the ground by a hurricane, and he himself was like semi-naked and starving, he would probably tell you that his situation is not without its difficulties. I <laughs> mean, this, this is a guy, who just imbibes diplomatic caution like mother's milk. Yet this past week, his rhetoric has become increasingly sharp on the war in Ukraine. He condemned explicitly the bombing of a children's and maternity hospital by the Russians in the middle of the week. On Saturday, he gave an interview in which he described the situation as rivers of blood and tears flowing and he specifically rejected Russia's description of all this as a special military operation, saying, words matter, and this is a war. Don't kid yourself. Now, however, in that same interview, Parlene indicated the Vatican's total availability to mediate this conflict. That's new language. In the past, they have said they would be glad to help. But this business about total availability is new. All of this suggests a new sense of urgency. Pope Francis himself did much the same thing in his Sunday Angelus address. He talked about the barbarity and the cruelty that the whole world was witnessing out of Ukraine. And then he kind of channeled his inner Oscar Romero. I mean, if you remember in El Salvador, shortly before Archbishop Oscar Romero was killed, he ordered the El Salvadoran army to stop brutalizing its own people. Well, Pope Francis on Sunday stood in at that window of the papal apartment overlooking St. Peter's Square, and he said, in the name of God, stop the massacre. I mean, he didn't directly say, Russia, in the name of God, stop the massacre. But, you know, who else would he be talking about? And so... The, the Vatican strategy here appears to be one of trying to increase the rhetorical pressure on Russia, while at the same time offering Russia a, a face-saving way out. Now, you know, we will see whether Putin is willing to take the invitation, but that appears to be what the Vatican is trying to do. Finally, could Pope Francis be the captain of the soft power resistance to the war in Russia? Joseph Nye of Harvard University famously distinguished between hard and soft power. 
Hard power basically being military and economic force, soft power being the power of persuasion. Now, so far, what those opposed to the war in Ukraine have deployed has largely been hard power. We are scrambling to arm the Ukrainians as quickly as we possibly can. And the West has also posed, imposed a series of crippling economic sanctions on Putin and his cronies, the oligarchs and on, oligarchs and on Russia. However, soft power has been a little bit missing in action. And here's the thing. It has become a staple of Western rhetoric to say that the whole world is united in its opposition of what Russia is doing. Well, the thing is, that's not true. We know China has been trying to thread the needle here. On the one hand, they are engaging in negotiations. Their diplomatic statements have been cautious. On the other hand, their state-run media is simply recycling every misrepresentation and bit of fake news that the Russian state media comes up with. The Gulf states, the United Arab Emirates recently said it would support increasing oil production to try to offset the negative consequences of the Russia sanctions, but many other Gulf states led by Saudi Arabia aren't in for it. And Africa, where Nobody is particularly enthusiastic about Putin's war, but many African leaders are saying that they're not going to sign off on treating Ukraine as the world's raging priority until long-running and oft-ignored conflicts in Africa get the same treatment. They're thinking about Ethiopia, they're thinking about Cameroon, about Eastern Congo, where similar kinds of carnage have been going on for a long time and nobody seems to get particularly worked up about it. So the question is, is there a, a figure on the global stage who has cachet in those three places, China, the Gulf states, and Africa, who could help promote a true spirit of global solidarity? Well, think about it. Pope Francis has made a controversial deal with China in order to keep his lines of communication open with them. He went to the United Arab Emirates in 2019, a phenomenally successful trip, and is well known for his outreach to the Islamic world. And of course, his affection for Africa is well documented. He's already been there four times and is slated to go again this year in a trip to South Sudan. So the possibility here is that Pope Francis could be the captain of the soft power team to bring this war to an end. Will it work? I don't know. I mean, Paul VI tried to end the war in Vietnam. We all know how that turned out. John Paul II tried to persuade President George Bush not to go in a war in Iraq. We also know how that turned out. But we also know we remember them for the effort, just as history will remember Francis and his team for their efforts right now. All right, on other fronts, we shift to Central America, the nation of Nicaragua, which, of course, is governed by President Daniel Ortega and his wife, Rosa Murtillo, who is the vice president. And their relation, listen, the Ortega's relationship with the Vatican has always been rocky, right? I mean, we can go back to the 1980s, the Sandinista era, when Ortega's minister of culture was a Catholic priest named Ernesto Cardinal. We all remember that famous gesture when John Paul II landed in Managua and Cardinal came and knelt in front of him and John Paul went like that to say, buddy, you got to get your situation right with the church. A Cardinal never, John Paul wanted him to get out of politics. Cardinal didn't. John Paul suspended him in 1984. Footnote, that suspension was finally lifted by Pope Francis in 2019. But flash forward to today, the Ortegas are no longer, I guess, darlings of the international left, but they are nevertheless still in charge of the country, and they still regard the Catholic Church and the Vatican as kind of public enemy number one. Recently, Catholic bishops in Nicaragua and the Pope's nuncio there, Polish Archbishop Waldemar Somtag, has been, have been denouncing the detention of political prisoners using that language, which the Ortega regime rejects, even though among those currently in detention is basically everyone who ran against Ortega in the last election. So how you can call those guys not political prisoners, I'm not quite sure. But in any event, Ortega was unhappy 
and so sontag has been expelled from the country of course a host government always has the right to expel an ambassador if they want to the vatican issued a statement in response to this expulsion saying it was incomprehensible and that archbishop sontag was actually trying to facilitate national dialogue and serve the country so they don't know what's going on here so far the vatican has not taken the typical retaliatory retaliatory step of expelling Nicaragua's ambassador from Rome because, honestly, Nicaragua at the moment doesn't have an, an ambassador to the Vatican. The position has been vacant for a while. Also, the Vatican indicates that for now, the nuncio, that is the Vatican embassy in Managua, will stay open. That's in part because bishops there are exposed to blowback themselves. Having an embassy there means somebody has their back. We'll see how that develops. In Puerto Rico, Bishop Daniel Fernandez, who was all of 58 years old, by the way, so this clearly had nothing to do with age, was removed from office this week. He did not resign. He was removed from office by Pope Francis. The, the one-line Vatican statement on the move gave no explanation, but pretty much everybody thinks they know what is going on here, which is earlier this year, the Puerto Rican bishops decided as a body that among the anti-COVID measures they were going to implement is that they were going to ask the vaccinated and unvaccinated to be in separate lines for the administration of communion. And they put out a document to that effect. Bishop Fernandez refused to sign that document and put out his own statement saying, it is legitimate for Catholics to have doubts about the safety and the efficacy of COVID vaccine. Now, like, of course, he is right as a technical matter that whether a particular vaccine works can never be an article of the faith. I mean, nobody's going to get excommunicated for doubting that these vaccines work. But it clearly was out of step, not only with the policies of his own brother bishops there in Puerto Rico, but also with the clear policies of Pope Francis, who has been a major champion of vaccinations on the global stage, suggested that getting the vaccine is basically a duty of solidarity to your fellow citizens, and has also supported all the other anti-COVID measures that governments in various places have decreed. And so, given the fact that Bishop Fernandez was sort of singing outside the choir, it was made clear to him by the nuncio in Puerto Rico that his services were no longer required. However, Bishop Fernandez chose to go public with all of this and say, I just wanted to be clear. I am not resigning. I am being fired. And I'm not resigning because I think all of this is unjust, unfair, and unwarranted. Now, none of that changes the fact that he is no longer the Bishop of Arecibo, but we'll see where the Fernandez story goes from here. We end this week in Hungary, where a court has rejected a lawsuit by the Vatican Bank seeking to recover several million euro that the Vatican believes it was defrauded of in a deal to buy, buy property in Budapest. See if this seems familiar. A few years ago, the Vatican decided it was going to sink millions of euro into buying a share of a rehab property in a swanky neighborhood. Now, that deal went horribly bad, and so the Vatican began looking for somebody to sue or charge criminally. If that seems familiar, it should. That's the narrative of the Vatican trial of the century currently going on involving the pur purchase of a piece of property in Chelsea in London. Only in this case, it's the purchase of the former Budapest Stock Exchange which is a kind of Beaux Arts building that was going to be rehabbed into mixed commercial residential development. Uh, the idea is the Vatican would make millions on the deal, but somehow the whole thing got bungled. And now the Vatican is claiming it was criminally defrauded. They have sued various players in this deal in Luxembourg, in Malta, and in Hungary to try to get their money back. The thing of it is, they've lost at every stage of the way. Every one of these courts has ruled that instead, the Vatican had signed the contract for this deal 
in 2013, early 2013, but after the election of Pope Francis, tried to back out of its contract without doing what you're supposed to do if you want to get out of a contract, which is pay a penalty. And so the, the ruling of these courts has been that this is simply mismanagement and poor judgment on the part of the Vatican, coupled with an inability to just take it, you know, take its losses. And in any event, it's not a good optic for the Vatican. It's not a good optic for the Vatican Bank. Certainly not a good optic for the Vatican trial as it goes forward. Now, what this may illustrate is either that the systems that were in place in 2018 through like 2017 were dysfunctional and corrupt, and so Pope Francis is right to try to tear it all apart and put it back together again. Or it may demonstrate that almost nine years into the financial reform, the Vatican appears to be making the same mistakes it always has. Maybe both of these things are true. We will have full coverage of all of this on the Crux site. Again, cruxnow.com. Now, finally, a very special shout out this week. You may remember that on past shows, I have described the most creative Catholic fundraising effort I have seen in a long time in the Diocese of Allentown in Pennsylvania, which was the Cooking with Clergy campaign, where different clergy would put videos of them making their favorite dishes online, and then people would vote with financial donations as to which one they liked best. Now, I mentioned in a recent show that one of these clergy who recorded one of these videos was shot wearing an apron, and that apron read, Many people who have eaten in this kitchen have gone on to lead healthy, normal lives. And I said, I would love to have one of those aprons, and if anyone could get me one, I would pay them off with a home-cooked plate of Amitrachana the next time we're here in Rome. Well, we are blessed with many great priests in the Catholic Church, but my new favorite priest is Father Phil Hamill of Provincetown, Massachusetts who made good on his word and got me this apron this week. I have already used it, Father Phil, to make Amitrajana. I will continue to do so. There is a plate with your name on it. Good on you, Father Phil Hamill. Thank you for being a friend, and thanks all of you who watch this show on a regular basis. All right, that is our show for this week. You will find everything we've talked about on Crux, cruxnow.com. Over the next seven days, my charge to you, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will talk to you again soon.